That's Joy from the very beginning, so you can blame him for Before. everything. Um, so Peter's going to talk today about how he's been or using OCI on route for the OCI IoT uh, contest that we've got running today. So upstairs near the theatre, there's a train track going around. That's a demo. That's all built using OCI on route. There's a contest that you can take part in. It's still open. It's not judged till the end of tomorrow. Peter's going to talk to you about it. And Peter's been uh, involved with creating OCI on route. OK. Thank you very Good. much. Thank you very much. Welcome. Um, well, after this great introduction, I can just start with the meet. We're going to talk a little bit about OCI on route and the IoT contest uh, we have done this year. I was getting kind of confused. I thought I would have an hour, uh, realizing I could have 50 minutes. Then he told me it was 25 minutes, and now I heard at uh, 35. So I'm a little bit confused. Uh, but I'll try to stop at uh, 30, I guess, then, at, at uh, 3.30. A uh, little bit, well, actually, the OGI relevancy just got killed because of the time constraints. <laughs> so I won't repeat that uh, here. Uh, talk a little bit about OGI and Root, and then about the community event contest, the architecture, the software, the hardware we developed, the experiences, and some nice uh, war stories that we had. What we're going to do with the contest in the future with OGI and OGI and Root. So that's the plan for today. Feel free to interrupt me, but it will mean that it goes off my time. But that's okay. Um, I shown this slide in um, the, the tutorial this morning as well, so there might be a little bit of overlap. Actually, if, if I had 50 minutes, there would be much more overlap. Uh, OGI en route. A couple of years ago, I decided to step outside the OGI, even after I had been working there for a long time because I felt that I was only talking about things and not doing it anymore. I, I'm normally used to work in the trenches to really understand the technology that I talk about. And after many years of spec writing, I felt that I was advocating something that I, well, I was feeling like a consultant and I didn't want to feel like a consultant. I want to get paid like a consultant, but I don't want to feel like it. Uh, um, I did a project that was JPM for J, which is a, a repository, it scans Maven, and it provides it as OSDI artifacts. Um, and I decided when I did that project, I was going to do that the OSDI way. And really, you know, when you use OSDI, a lot of people love OSDI because it has modularity, and they think that is class loaders. And though I think we have by far the best class loaded architecture in the whole worldwide Java market, uh, that, is, uh, uh, that, that, that is just an implementation detail for me. For me, the value in OSDI has always been 100% services. Services from the first day that I saw OSDI, it was uh, invented by a guy from Sun. I saw that moment and said, that's it. That's really the problem that solves uh, the basic computing problem. How do you manage coupling? A little bit like we got interfaces in Java that solved the class coupling problem. Uh, OCI or services, OCI services uh, solve the, the module coupling problem. You know, when you start doing your Hello World in Maven and you download the internet, that's the module coupling, transitive coupling problem that I'm talking about. It's not Maven's fault, it's, it's the architecture of modules coupling to modules. Anyway, long story short, uh, I proved to myself that I hadn't been with my head in the clouds. Uh, I actually have been, that everything I said about those services was really true. But I also found out that there was a lot of stuff missing. It was really hard to get up to speed in OCI. You could go to Caraf, that's probably one of the best if you want to stay in open source. That's an all co encompassing Java EE like environment to get started. But the threshold was pretty steep. It wasn't just, oh, let, like Ruby on Rails, you download it, and 10 minutes later, you got a GUI on your screen. And I think that was really missing in OCI. So I talked to the board and said, and they had the same feeling, something, we, we, we're making great specs, so why isn't the whole world using our stuff? Um, well, specs are not sufficient. So, and there is a, I already talked about uh, Ruby on Rails. Uh, there's a big envy for me because I, I, I programmed in many different languages. I'm originally a small talker. That's my favorite language still. And it's incredibly interactive. You really, you get into this flow of developing 
and not in this, oh, let me type a little bit and then get coffee after the compiler is finished and then do the debugger and deploy. It's really about save, see what it is, save, debug, edit. That cycle should be really, really short. And in the dynamic languages, it's really, it is short and it's very much focused on making web applications. And then you go to Java and I was, yeah, and it's a lot harder to get started because well, you have to fire up Eclipse and then uh, you have to start a project and then you have to create a package and then you have to create a source file. And so, and it's also a bit of a generational thing. I'm 57, so I'm really old, uh, probably older than anybody else in the room. Um, but I have one advantage. I've seen about four different generations. I've seen the minis, I've seen the micros, I've seen the, the op I've been very, very active in the object-oriented world in the 80s. Um, I've seen this happening before. You, um, we, we get in the Java world, we're a little bit uh, worrying about mortgages, not that much anymore about uh, making really cool stuff that impresses. That's the JavaScript world at the moment. There's a lot of energy there. And wouldn't it be great? Because there's a big thing is that all these languages have a big problem. When you, when you get into more functionality, when the system grows, they tend to get exponentially more complicated. It's very hard when you use Python to make something really big. It's, it's, it just doesn't scale very well. Well, when you go to Java, and especially with OSDI, it's a high starting point, but the growth is much less. You can go much further before you're actually gonna run out of space there. So what we really want to do is we want to move the thing down, and that's what OCI tries to accomplish. So what we've done there is we said no choices. It's not, you know, in the Java world, we're crazy about choices. We hate committing ourselves to anything. We have factory builder builders just to defer the choices of what we're finally going to get. This is all hard-coded. We're going to say, you can later, if you got it all working and you like it, you can switch and do whatever you want and pick. But when you start using our root, we picked R6, we picked BND, we picked BND tools, we picked Gradle, we picked GitHub, and we picked Travis. Okay, if you do a little bit of work, you can probably change it into Git, uh, to, to GitLab or, or uh, Jenkins or uh, IntelliJ is working on it. But this is what we present. So you can download it, you can start playing with it. Now, BND tools is a crucial part. Again, I'm still, from a small talk background, you really like GUIs. I think you can be much more productive. I actually was just sitting next to a guy who was using Eclipse with VI. I don't know if we have any of those people here. Um, but you can be so much more productive in a good graphic environment if you really go with the flow. Uh, and especially with visualizations. Being details is really trying to do that. One of the things we have that is pretty crucial is that when you go to OCI, you get hundreds of components, up to thousands of components. How do you manage that? How do you make that list of all those bundles belonging together? That is really, really, really hard. And even if you're in Maven, you, you want to get 100 in your, your runtime system, but you're going to end up with 400, and then you have to start pruning and to figure out where the, the, the overlaps are because people use two different versions. It's really hard to, when you get to those numbers, we try to automate, we're automating that because OCI developed a constraint language, requirements and capabilities for that, and we're trying to automate that and we have tools for that and BND tools so that you don't have to do that yourself. And this is just one example, but there are, are lots, we have semantic versioning and we actually calculate it for you instead that you have to do it yourself. It's, it's we try to automate all those things that are really hard. Um, and we have templates. It's also when you start with BND tools, you download it, uh, and you use the on root templates, and you really, some people in the tutorials didn't really use them, so they ended up with really weird environments. But if you use the on root templates, one of the templates is an application, and it is a back end server, a REST server. It's a front end GUI with Angular. Um, it's got, uh, it, it's basically, it's not doing anything useful. It turns a word into uppercase, which there are probably better ways to do that. But you've got the whole thing suddenly there. And that really works. I already see a lot of people that instead of just making some command line thingy, they actually make a GUI because now suddenly you, you have the whole thing um, in two minutes. We didn't stop there because we are, all of us, pretty much fanatics about um, uh, software engineering. And continuous integration is an incredibly important aspect of that, of course. So we integrate with Git and Travis. So you, out of the box, 
you create a workspace, you make your, your bundles in there, and you completely integrate with continuous integration. So you, 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 you don't have to set anything up. That's all included in the package when you download BND and you use the BND tools, uh, the OZI on root uh, <coughs> templates. So that's from the developer pure side. The other thing with OZI is that I'm actually uh, pretty arrogant now, but I think we have the best specs in the market. They are very thoroughly vetted. They are, are, are pretty formal. They are really good. And we can see that in practice because there's very few portability problems. And when there is a problem, we can always say, you're wrong and he's right, or you're both wrong. Uh, uh, spec is right. <laughs> so the, um, the, the good news is the specs are good. The bad news is that they are pretty lousy if you want to use them. Uh, the, the, the implementers love them because it's really all, all the corner cases, well not all, most of the corner cases are nicely described. When you use a service, you don't care about the corner cases. You just want to know how do I use it in my normal way. So what is maybe one or two lines in the specification is very important for somebody that wants to start using it. So what we also made is a website. And that website, the, the ambition of that website is to become the primary place where you go to figure out how to use OSEI. We don't want to be a distribution. It's not that we want to take over Carafe or, or, or uh, become an application server. We're not a commercial company, but this should be the hub where you go for finding, how do I use the configuration admin servers? Or why should I use the configuration admin servers? Um, plus tutorials. We've um, got four tutorials now. There is one this morning in the, tutor the tutorial that I gave, I had asked everybody over mail to do the quick start tutorial, and then I found out that 50% had not received my mail. So uh, the tutorial that I actually gave might have been a little bit too complicated because people had to still go through the basics. But this is a perfect tutorial to go through the basics. It really, in half an hour or so, you're up to speed, you run it, you got a GUI application, and you can modify it, you could put breakpoints break in the REST server, um, and you can start adding more methods to the REST API and calling it from the Angular JavaScript API. So everything is there, documented, ready to go. Um, the second tutorial is really about software engineering. It tells you you should start with API, and then you should make uh, implementation, and then you should do testing, and then you should... So for each of these different types, there are templates, and the base tutorial explains everything from, from simple API design all the way up to continuous integration on Travis, how to do that, how to set it up. And again, it's, everything is very well supported by BND tools and BND. Um, then we have my favorite. We have the IoT tutorials, because for OZI and for everybody in the world at this moment, IoT is becoming a, a important uh, material. And it's my first love, so uh, uh, I um, originally I'm a hardware designer, so this is still uh, close to my heart. So uh, there's a tutorial that allows you to use BND tools with a Raspberry Pi. It's uh, how to do the remote debugging, how to set it up, and it's fantastic because you've got OSEI's dynamics, so you just, you just save your, your code and it's saved on the Raspberry Pi and, and you can run it. It's, it's really it looks like you're running it on your own machine. So you've got your Eclipse on your machine, you talk to the Raspberry Pi, and there is a shell. You can execute the shell commands on the Raspberry Pi. It works like, like your local machine, but you can do all the cool stuff on the Raspberry Pi. And we added a few libraries in, um, in our route for controlling the, the GPIO and, and interacting with that. Um, and then the tutorial I gave this morning, which is the next step in the whole family, um, distributed OCI, and that's part of the, uh, the contest that I'll talk about a little bit later. One of the coolest parts of OCI today is the, and there's a lot of cool parts, uh, <laughs> is the distributed OCI. You know, when you have the service model, a service can be local in the system, but in OCI it's trivial to say this service should actually be available in another uh, OCI framework. 
And it's unbelievable how simple, complicated things get when you have that model, when you can say, I don't really care why my bundle is running as long as I can see the service that comes from it. Again, there's lots of complexity around it as well, which I tell you about in a little bit later. But this isn't a cool tutorial if you want to go basically to the next step and want to use OZI and scale it up to cluster kind of things. Um, then what we added is how-tos. How do you do service-oriented uh, system design, uh, design by contracts, the, 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 the whole diagramming that is used in OZI for services and bundles. Um, so this is really trying to teach the basics of how you really and, and, and one big difference is with what you find in a lot of blogs and on the net is we're not talking about how it was yesterday. We just explain how you should do it today. If you want to go to the history, love to talk to you, but that's not, it's, it's really what is the best practice today? And that's what we try to keep up there. Um, talked already a little bit about this one. Uh, I'm, we made a whole list with all the, the services that we basically have in our route. And they're not all filled in yet, because it's a lot of work to do that. But basically, for each service that is out there, uh, configuration admin, remote service admin, HTTP service, we try to create a page like a data sheet. You know, uh, as a hardware guy, I love data sheets. They are very nice. They give you a concise overview, and they give you all the details. This really tells you with a quick picture, this is how the thing is structured. This is how the, the architecture is. Then when should I use it? What is the, the, the reasons? What are the patterns to use it? And then some copy and pasteable things because that is already al always very nice to get started. And there's quite a few there, not all of them, uh, but we'll expand that. And if you feel the inclination to help out, then please submit a pull request, uh, love it. At the end, there is also uh, frequently asked questions, uh, discussions, if something is contentious. And I hope I'm talking to some people to get also uh, a tab per, for example, a Caraf tab, so that Caraf can put some Caraf specific information in there and maybe a Liberty specific tag uh, uh, tab. Uh, so you get, so this should really become a hub where people yeah. say, okay, how do I use Config Admin? This is how I use Config Admin. Um, then the patterns that we have in OGI, we got the whiteboard pattern and they have never been formally defined. They have been, invented along the way, used and blocked about, and people pick it up, trying to get a little bit more formal definition, uh, explain what is it really, how can you use it, uh, and again. So this is OSEI en route. Uh, we're at release one. We're trying to decide how to continue with this. Um, but I already see the effects of it, that having this hub of information, having a tool that really shows what the best practices in OSEI are definitely having that effect. We're really trying to work with the, uh, the community, uh, Caraf, uh, we talked about this morning, uh, but I'm already uh, uh, with Christian Schneider to, to see how much we can, uh, can work together. Um, already I'm a committer on Felix, I'm a committer on Equinox, really trying to, to do that shared part, uh, get it in one place. Because currently, actually, if you look at OZI and to do X, I, Y, or Z, you find a lot of shit out there uh, because it's a long history. Sorry? It's all, yeah, it's, it's all on GitHub. So the whole website is on GitHub. All the repositories for the tutorials are on GitHub. So whenever you feel like it and you have nothing to do, go there and see if, if you can add a chapter or you can, again, my English needs corrections as well. So if you want to review it, uh, pull request is very highly appreciated. But even if you don't, this one is going to grow. This one, we're going to work very hard to make this the, the place to go of how to use OCI, not how to implement it, but how to use it. Then we go to the IOD contest, and I got 10 minutes left. Eight, five, four. I started later, so I get a few more yeah, minutes. Yeah, OK, good. <laughs> what? OK. Um, last year, we had the exciting, uh, but actually must have been a lot easier um, <laughs> From ease of mind point of view, uh, we emulated the windmill uh, for the IoT demo, which uh, it was a good demo for, for showing that you get some events. We got the wattage, and, but 
I guess I've never really been one that, that doesn't uh, <laughs> try to run some risks. So we decided this year we wanted to do something else. No emulated windmills. Now, what I really wanted to do, and what I pushed for the Root project, um, was the Rube Goldberg contraption. You know what a Rube Goldberg contraption is? It's basically a machine that tries to do something really simple in a really complicated way. And my goal was to create a Rube Goldberg contraption that would run worldwide. So we would make, a, there's a really good video from a, what is the name of the group? OK Go. OK, you should look it up. It's unbelievably good. It's, it's, it's a, a music video, and it co it's about five minutes or so. And it is a continuous, you know, a ball drops, and it kicks this, and it, well, it continues like. So I thought we should make that, and then with a Raspberry Pi, and your Raspberry Pi would Finalize, we put video on it, so we, anyway. Um, this really got killed, oh, actually. So this was the architecture. So I was really enthusiastic, was already, we had a server set up and uh, full of energy, but we killed it uh, because somebody came up with the m a remark that uh, doing something in a complicated way, maybe not such a good advertisement for OCI. Um, so then we came up with the idea of a collect. Uh, racetrack where we would do some measuring and eventing on. Uh, we killed that one because it turned out to be really hard uh, to actually position these things in time and then react to that. It's, uh, uh, we wanted to use RFID, which is a nice story that will come later. Um, so this was out because the positioning was really the hard. So what is left then? And Hey, I'm a boy. I played with Lego when I was young. So what is actually more interesting than have a Lego train? It's uh, actually, it's, it's, it's fantastic. We got this, we put everything up upstairs yesterday. We've never had so many people come look at OSGI. And actually, actually, even lots of women. I've never seen any woman look at OSGI so far. And now we got suddenly all that interest. <laughs> It's, it's really, I think it's the biggest boost for us yeah, since, uh, since we had the service. Uh, so what we decided to do is to, um, to create a track, and on the track we would measure the position, and then have a contest. And the contest was that we would have two parties. We, would have, we wanted to have multiple trains. Then you need one party that is gonna manage the train track, because you need somebody to manage the, the signals, the semaphores, and the, the switches, that the train shouldn't manage that, that. You need somebody that has the overview. And the other part is the train manager, which has to decide, he gets an assignment, go from segment A4 to D8, uh, then he has to calculate a route, which switches shall I take. Uh, but he shouldn't just take it, he shouldn't ask the track manager, can I ask to the next segment? Can I get the switch to that position? Can I, uh, so you get this interaction between the train managers and the track manager. And then the contest was, and again, we haven't proven it yet because we have a few uh, issues still to work out, but it, it looks good, we think we're getting there. Um, the train manager, if they don't behave, they will collide, of course, that would be the real fun, uh, but it is, kind of an interesting model because you got these three independent parties written by independent people and they all have to collaborate through the OSDI service registry to see if they can uh, create a safe situation. So, wonderful problem. The more elaborate architecture is that we have this track manager. These are the, the, the services, the track, uh, the track manager then could be written by a contestant registers a service, the service is picked up by the train manager, register, they can be written by the contestants. Um, and then we have some uh, controllers, the track controller talks to the segment controllers on the hardware, so this is the low level GPIO stuff running on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, the train controller has a, the train manager talks to the train controller, we have, we're using infrared, the Lego trains use infrared, so we connected the Raspberry Pi through infrared to, uh, uh, to the hardware. Um, now the beauty of OCI here is that we can basically decide very late in the process where we run stuff. And in this case, we couldn't of course have every contestant build up this whole elaborate track. You still 
probably already have seen how much space we're using. Um, so we created an emulator. We put some naming in there. We call these small parts, basically every rails is a segment. And then a set of uh, segments that form, that are between switches, we, uh, we call them a track. And we put out of IDs in there, those are all the blue things. And they also, each one of them, every switch has a signal. And the switches are also controlled electronically by the Raspberry Pi. So it's a, actually, when you look at it upstairs, it's a pretty impressive uh, setup. Then what we did is um, we created a configuration. This is basically for every rails we define if it's straight, parallel, how long it is. Uh, uh, we connect it to the controller. Uh, this is... Uh, quite elaborate because it, it, it grows quickly. But this is basically read by the train managers and the track managers to figure out how the world looks like. And in the context, it, they must be able to adapt. So if you change the configuration, they should be able to react to the changes in the world. Then we create a user interface that automatically reads the configuration and then builds the, uh, the topology of the track. And this is also connected to the emulator. So people could actually write a track manager. We, we provide an example train manager, an example track manager, and you can run them in the emulator. It's pretty cool because you get some breakpoints, you can react to the events, you can... Uh, it's, it's actually a wonderful way to get started with OSDI because the emulator means that you can just run it on your desktop. Um, on the user interfaces, we configure trains. When you see a train, you can say, go to that point and then he'll continue. I talked about the emulator, yeah. So we put the whole SDK on, uh, on, the, on the web. You can download it, it's quite easy, it's all well described. Talked about distributed OSI already. We got Prosys and Parimus working together in the clouds to handle the deployment. Yes, I know. Three more minutes. <laughs> and we got distributed OSI which means that we can basically move controllers and we uh, currently we do the segment controller, for example, the switch controller run in the Pi, uh, creates a service and that gets exported into the cloud where we have the train manager. But we could also actually run the train manager in the, in the Pi. We didn't make that decision until the day before. Um, I'm gonna skip this. Uh, this is basically what it showed that you can move it around because I want to spend a little bit of time to the hardware. The guy that did the hardware, he's from Bremers and he spent an insane amount of time. He actually got the short straw. <laughs> you know, I, I wanted to have that short straw, but I was the only one who could do the GUI, so I ended up with the GUI, but he had a lot more work than we had envisioned. Um, we had, of course, to make the switches electronic. Uh, he developed uh, a plug-in board for the Raspberry Pi so we could control the switches and the signals and uh, the RFID reader. Very cool nowadays. Uh, you can really design hardware quite cheaply or, or uh, be built. There's a product called Fritzing, and you basically make a prototype. You turn it into a breadboard, and these components are really cheap nowadays. It's unbelievably cheap, and I'm a bit... But they're no longer reliable. Well, we get to that point, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> And then actually for a very, very low price, you know, 20, 30 euros or something like that, you can turn it into a printed circuit board, which really looks pretty cool, I think. He did a fantastic job there. It's, it's Derek Baum, uh, uh, applaud him for what he's done here. So this is basically the board on a Raspberry Pi, very clean, and you can see it is really nice because it, even the colors on the wires are very nicely aligned, uh, very impressive. So this is the, the switch. The signal, the semaphores, uh, and this is the culprit. This is the one that really hurt us yesterday terribly. Um, we uh, get back to the later. Okay, this was basically me. I, ha I had all the railses because my kids used to play with it, so I had a big bag full of railses. Uh, this was how it looked yesterday. It was not, you know, we're real men. We actually use drills as well. <laughs> And building it up, this is Vanelin, he's from Processed. And then we got back to the RFID. Um, uh, <laughs> these are six euros, and that's about six euros too much. Uh, we blame this guy. 
the X-Brain machine ate our RFIDs. According to Tim, who is a, 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 a master's uh, in uh, computer, no, not f in physics, uh, so he, he says the, the X-Brain machine ate our RFID tags. Uh, <laughs> so last night, I raced to Stuttgart to buy microswitches. I figured out with microswitches, we could actually make a change. So we spent a lot of time there. And we're currently uh, doing the last part to get it all working on, not an RFID, but using normal switches in the rails. And then uh, using some heuristics to figure out which train is hitting the switch. Of course, you can, uh, um, which then uh, actually, I rushed a little bit, but it brings me to the Q&A, and I think I'm pretty good on time. Yeah? Hey, a bit more positive, yeah? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can you ask any questions? or? Uh? David. I'm pretty sure all these guys already have a Raspberry Pi lying in a... <laughs> so, okay. so the one thing you forgot to say 